So I'll just give you a rundown real quick over my dissertation topic. So this topic was an evolution of my main advisor, Dr. John Ricketts, not wanting to do anything economic related and me not wanting to do anything that was high school education related. So we met in the middle on the topic of farm management because Dr. Ricketts has said that farmer education is still agriculture education, which is what my PhD is in, is in agricultural education. So we went back and forth. My, my initial topic was uh, irrigation management practices because when I was at Extension, I did a needs assessment and that was one of the needs uh, that was identified that farmers wanted more education on, was utilizing uh, irrigation primarily in cotton and soybeans as well. After doing some literature review, it was very apparent that that was a very niche topic and very difficult to find information on, so we decided to step back. So this is a diffusion of innovation study on the different categories of adopters of farmers adopting technology across the state. So we started off with a, a Delphi study. I wanted to try to do a mixed methods approach. I wanted to do something that was somewhat qualitative. Honestly, this has turned into a complete quantitative study. What we started off with, though, was doing a Delphi study, essentially surveying producers that are on the Tennessee Soybean Promotion Board, the Tennessee Corn Promotion Board, also members of the Tennessee Cotton Council and the Tennessee Cattle Association. So we sent out two surveys statewide that was in our, in our Delphi. And what we're trying to figure out is what key factors influence a farmer's decision to adopt a new technology. Now, within the survey, we use the definition of a technology as anything that is a new production practice. It's not just simply something that is agricultural machine and equipment. It's not necessarily just artificial insemination. It could be anything. It could be any new innovation that a farmer is adopting. So that also means it may not necessarily be cutting edge technology. It's something that's new to the participant of the survey. There's numerous studies that we looked at that focused on agricultural innovations, whether they were in other states, other countries, but there was not anything that I saw in the literature review that was applicable to just Tennessee. So that's what we decided to do. I'm sure you are all well aware of the influential factors that make a farmer decide whether to adopt a new technology or not. Um, the first one that came to our mind was economics, but in doing some research, realize that there's more research on the socioeconomics. Are you adopting a new technology because of peer influence? We try to incorporate the element of sustainability. I wanted to call it agronomics. <laughs> when we did the Delphi study, it was ranked last by every producer. Virtually no one cared about sustainability production practices or technology that would improve sustainability. So that has been completely removed probably reason from the dissertation. Yes, uh, it's hard to quantify. Uh, the other thing is a lot of a lot of the producers uh, when they when they might when they commented on sustainability, they would just say that it's very difficult for me to identify what you're calling sustainability. Uh, so that was part of it. Because in the Delphi, there was the ability to do comments or open-ended questions. Uh, so I'll just kind of give you some of the results from the from the Delphi. These are categorization of adopters. Now, the reason why I left this in here is I just sent out my statewide survey last Friday to a list of producers that we received from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. I didn't know this, but we were waiting on a list from Farm Service Agency, and I just found out yesterday that that's not even legal for them to give me. So I waited 90 days to find out it was my request, my FOIA request was going to be denied again. They even they even gave us an email saying we're modifying or, or we're giving you an extension. We won't have a response for you until possible at the end of this month. And I finally reached out to our state contact and they just finally said, well, you can't even get that information anyway. So we waited three months for nothing. So luckily we had an email list from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture for this. But either way, this is Rogers Diffusion of Innovations with our, our innovators being the pioneers of a new technology. We have early adopters. Those are, of course, the first ones to adopt new technology. Now, the innovators are also those that also design and conceive the technology. And then we have early, late majority of migrants. And one of the reasons why I want to pause here for a moment, I'm, I'm sort of going to order Dr. Delmont. I hope that's all right. One of the reasons why I want to bring this up is I actually have some preliminary data from the survey. So I do have a bell curve, which I'm excited about. Uh, this is the responses from the 
uh, from the, uh, let me think here, this is the row crop producer survey. And so most of our identifying is group three, which is going to be our uh, early majority. Now, I piloted the survey initially with students in all of my classes, and we had well over 100 responses. And what we found out was I had definitions that came from Roger's Diffusion of Innovation Theory book, the, the text or the actual book that he's written. And it was, I would say, a little, I wouldn't say misleading, but it made these responses very biased because this one was the one that sounded the most positive. And so it really skewed it to about 60% of the responses where as you can see here, we have about uh, 72 out of 173, so not too bad. I think it ended up being 44%, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, now on the, I think it was the row crop pictures. This is the row crop, and I'm mistaken. I told you wrong. That was the live crop pictures. This is the row crop pictures description of whether they're uh, a early majority or a majority, and we have a real nice bell curve there as well. So I was glad to see that because when I did the pilot, it was extremely biased between group three and group four. Uh, the reason why we didn't put the actual description on there, that was actually a recommendation from Rogers himself in his book, is group five is considered a laggard. I don't know anybody that wants to self identify as a laggard because it has a negative connotation. So that was the reason why we adjusted the survey there. But back to the Delphi, I'm actually going to try to get down here to the results of the Delphi itself or what a Delphi is. Some of you are very familiar with it. I know Dr. Delmont helped me designed the Delphi and was very helpful in uh, critiquing it and, and making sure that it was asking the right questions. So the Delphi is nothing more than asking a group of experts, what's your opinion? That's all it is. It's, it's what's your opinion, but you're going through multiple rounds. So the first round of the Delphi, we were asking producers to list technologies that they were currently considering adopting. And then we did, we did three rounds going back to these producers, as you can well aware, if we go back to the same people over and over asking for more responses or more feedback, response rates have felt good. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. Either way, we define consensus as a simple majority. On some questions, we reached a consensus. On others, we did, we did not. But the Delphi was a recommendation from my dissertation committee. That I'm glad they actually recommended this because up until this point, I thought I knew what I wanted my topic to be, but this really honed down on exactly which way we were going to go with it. Because we talked about using the categories of adopters. We talked about using a binary variable of just did they decide to adopt or not. We had also talked about taking out demographic information, adding it in. My dissertation committee disagreed on several different things as it related to the structure or what questions to ask, but I also have uh, dissertation commitments from various backgrounds. Some are ag education, some of them are agricultural economics, uh, one of them is communication, one of them is plant soil science. So a lot of different backgrounds there. So I think that was part of it. But either way, one thing that was interesting to me was when I contacted the president of each of these commodity associations, two of them were already doing this internally. The Cotton Council was somewhat doing this internally, but now the Tennessee Soybean Promotion Board after I talked to Steph and Moffin, it was very aware, very apparent that they are very interested in this as well because they actually have hired a consulting group to come in and answer these questions for them. Because what they're trying to decipher is if I am going to spend money on research or in promoting these uh, information, where do I do that? Do I uh, promote seed genetics? Are we interested in other things that are related to soil information? Uh, so that was why they're interested. The other part that came from Stefan and his group that we added into the Delphi and into the statewide survey for my dissertation is asking producers, where do you get your information from and what method of delivery? That's really what the Soil Bank Promotion Board is interested in. They want to know through what channels do they spend their money on marketing and what information sources the farmers actually use. And we'll, we'll actually get to what the farmers said on that as well. Uh, as far as we've worked with the definition of technology, so I'll move on. But now I did ask the participants in round one what factors influence their decision to adopt. That was a open-ended question. We also asked them what barriers prevented them from adopting a new technology. And then as requested by the Soil Bank Promotion Board, and I'm, I'm glad that we added this, what sources and information that they use when they are looking to adopt a new technology? And then what is their primary method of receiving that information when they're trying to make a decision to adopt a new technology. I have, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scroll down so much. There we are. So the results, we sent it out to 29 producers. 
That is also going to, that includes livestock and row crop. Of the breakout, if I'm not mistaken, was 17 livestock and 12 row crop. Now, I went ahead and added the UT Extension State Specialist because I'm aware, or well, and you all are too as researchers, that they are conducting research on new technologies that a farmer may not have access to yet. And so some of the responses aligned with producers. Some of them did not, particularly on the livestock side. And this has been reported, so I'll, I'll hesitate to say that. There was some research that was being conducted by some parties that is not applicable to our producers. So they, those technologies were excluded because it's not technologies that our farmers will use, but may be used in a very large commercial operation. Uh, as far as the, uh, the um, let's see, let me get down here to the actual the result of the Delphi. The livestock producers described the technology they were looking to adopt were automation within their, their tractors. GIS essentially is what they all, I lumped that under an umbrella term. There were several different things. That they listed here as all GIS applications on a spring system. Haywood, if they were looking to adopt that into their forage program, some people just simply said improvements in grass species or improvements in grazing, so all of the category of forage production. Uh, new chemicals came up not only in the livestock, but also in the row crop. Uh, this one was very close to being the top of vaccination medications. And then, of course, uh, RDIF tags, uh, RFI tags, I should say. And then, of course, reproductive technologies. This ended up being the most important, and we did reach consensus on this. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I lump these under reproductive technologies because within the producers that responded, I had to be mindful that some of them were cow calf producers, some of them were seed stock producers, and some of them were registered cattle producers. So some of them are, for, are completing tasks that our average farmer is not going to complete, particularly our seed stock producers. So the reason why I label it as reproductive technology is AI. Most of our farmers can do that. Very few of our farmers will set up an embryonic transfer and very, very few will perform or will use that same. Hello, Dr. Dave. Uh, now, we did have one dairy producer respond, so sex same was important to them. And we also had some of our seed stock producers say sex same was important to them. But as a whole, I would say AI is the most important. As far as apps that they were using, it was just like cattle match structure. There's nothing really new there. Now, the row crop producers, this was all over the board. Uh, personally, when I went into this, I was thinking that more producers would be interested in the biologicals. That, that was listed by a few, but not by many. Really, I did think it was interesting. Of the two that responded, <laughs> two of them were dealers. So I was, I was familiar with what they said they were important. So that was a little biased on their part. But what did come up a lot was fertility. People wanting to identify new ways of improving uh, or timing or replacement or uh, this, these two went hand in hand. A lot of people would list precision and infertility together, essentially just trying to boost output. Uh, it was also mentioned a lot of seed genetics. Now, the reason why I listed all these different ones is these were listed by the producers. But remember, who are we talking to? We're talking to the Cotton Council, Soybean Board, and the Corn Promotion Board, and all of them have different genetics that they're looking at. Uh, Thrive On, I was, that was a mixed bag. And the reason why I say that is because some of the producers were very excited about that seed genetics, but some of them had already completed harvest. I, I should have backed up and told you this. We sent this out in September, but some of it, we let it run for, I believe, six weeks, if I'm not mistaken. I may be wrong on that. So some were pre-harvest, some were post-harvest. The producers that were post-harvest, some of them were pretty down on Thrive on Cotton. They said that they experienced about 120 pound yield lag using that genetic. So uh, jury's out on whether that one works or not with the few that responded to the survey. That, that really doesn't matter to what we're after, but it's just an interesting point that came up in the open-ended questions. Okay, factors that were important, a lot of these are overlapping. But what we, what we pulled out of this was four factors that we looked at. Compatibility, we also looked at cost of the technology, economic factors, and peer influence. It was the four factors that we ended up sending out statewide. Uh, a lot of the farmers that we surveyed did list something that had an economic component to it. Some listed the sustainability factors, but after we got into rounds two and three, these really fell off. Those really didn't have many to support that and making it to the final version of the survey we sent out. Okay, barriers, very common ones that we've seen, a lack of product knowledge, a lack of support of a product, 
uh, the cost. Uh, there is no economic return. The word that is used a lot is lack of a return on investment, lack of ROI. What do you expect to say that? Now, the delivery methods, how do, how do producers receive new information? These are the ones that came up by several of our participants was that we use a independent consultant that may be a nutritionist. If we're talking about a dairy producer, a lot of them use a crop consultant or agronomist. Uh, there was mention of even a, uh, what was the one that the livestock producers mentioned? I forgot. Oh, the uh, select, select sires or a breeder that gives them advice on their, on their livestock operation. Someone that's just seen as an independent party. Yes, they're selling a product, but they're also selling something that the producer identified in value. So we had industry representatives there. There's a lot of overlap between these two. Uh, a lot of emphasis was placed on on farm trials. The producer is interested in adopting a new technology, but I want to try it just a little bit on, on part of acreage or a part of the herd, and then we'll look to adopt it maybe next year if it does well. Some said that they turned to commodity groups for information. Um, some listed the extension agent. Some even listed uh, using Facebook groups, Facebook forums. And to be honest, that's where I usually turn to for a lot of my information. And I see a lot of our producers that I know here in our area. This is anecdotal evidence. I know this is anecdotal. But a lot of producers that are my age, I do see pop up in there quite a bit asking questions. Because you have access to farmers nationwide at your fingertips. And you can get some really good information on in those, in those forms. All right. So primary delivery method was a mix. We had uh, field days and local meetings. Trade shows was also included in that. Uh, people coming to the farm and providing the farmers with information. This one didn't have a lot of a lot of people mention this, but some people mentioned that they listened to uh, the likes of uh, Corn Warriors, which is a program on RFTTV, which is uh, it's these farmers that are in the Midwest that are chasing real high, high yields. That's like a reality TV show, but they also have podcasts. So producers said that they turn in to try to uh, learn new production practices. Of course, traditional media. Um, you said that they use social media. There's a lot of overlap with people saying social media and YouTube are the same thing and just following people. But we can also use YouTube, but getting the information from Extension as well. Round two, we aggregated the results uh, from round one and then sent them back out. We only had 17 completed responses. Uh, we had where we had 24 in the first round, so you see that it started to, to drop off. What we see here is that. Uh, let's see, we had a five-way tie in round two for the most important technology, according to our uh, row crop producers. So we didn't have anything that broke the tie there, but in round three, we we did reach consensus. Get to that just a minute. Let's see. And then, of course, on our livestock producers, they identified uh, they identified new vaccinations and artificial insemination as a as the overarching or the, the main technology that they were looking to adopt. Now, when we got to round two. We did reach consensus on what factors influence farmers the most. Uh, the economic benefit was by far the most important factor, followed very closely with ease of use or compatibility factors and the cost of technology. Now, I mentioned earlier that we dropped sustainability from the statewide survey. This was at a recommendation of the dissertation committee to remove that, but incorporate peer influence to see how influential a social factor was. Instead of everything just being maybe economic driven, let's add a social factor there. The, the next question was what bears are most in the lack of economic benefit was the number one. So we didn't necessarily get our 51% of consensus, but it was the majority, or the majority of people did say it was the economic, lack of an economic benefit that uh, would keep them from adopting technology. Most farmers said they wanted to uh, receive information from other producers. Uh, very few people said that they received their information with extension, and my extension agent heard that <laughs> when I saw that, because you, you would like to think that that's a source of unbiased, independent data, but that's just not the case. Very few people listed. And I even included the state specialist in the choice. They could choose a state specialist or county agent, and they simply said that they received their information primarily from working with other producers. Now, also being... Um, formerly involved in ag sales, it doesn't surprise me, that they turn to other producers because a lot of times what you'll see in an area is you will have a producer that is, I don't know a better word for it, but the leading producer and that everybody looks to and is whatever they're doing, I would like to adopt or be or be 
nosy enough to find out more about. And so we saw that in the results as well. So is it because of who you were surveying yeah. that they aren't using extension so much because they're already involved with the, you know, these are the ones that are up there because they're on the soybean commotion board or the cotton board or the board. a smaller scale, you're going to be looking at, at ones that are looking more at the I'll scale. say this, and, and, and again, this is anecdotal. When we, when I was at Extension and I worked there for six years, our new clientele was not row crop producers. The days of row crop producers using Extension for anything other than getting certification for pesticides is about gone because they're so behind. Because the because the seed genetics, the chemical trials are done by the companies. Those companies will come to your farm and do the trials with you or for you even. And it's very difficult to get those producers to put in plots that even, even the county agents want to do. Um, really what you're seeing now is the county agents, when they do those trials, they're doing it with smaller producers and smaller equipment that will slow down and do it for the producer. Um, and this is just my personal opinion. Uh, the, the caveat is that the seed is given to the producer. That's one of the reasons why I think the small farmers will do it. It's an economic incentive to them. The bigger farmers, they don't care about that. Why, why would they care about a few bags of seed? It's nothing to them. They're very large and they don't want to slow down. They need to cover a lot of acres very quickly. Uh, and something else that has changed is that the agronomic knowledge of the average agent is not as strong as it used to be. It's just not, unfortunately. A lot of the knowledgeable agents have retired, and the ones that have come up after them have not yet gained that agronomic knowledge to be that consultant that the farmer will use. That's my personal opinion. And I have, I have several friends that are agents. Now, I can name a few, like Jake Mallory in Gibson County. He's a heck of an agronomist. Now, he I would trust as a source. Some of them I would not, because they're more animal science focused. That's one thing you have to consider too, is what's the agent's background in those row crop producing counties. If it's not row crop, they're not really going to call them. But again, that's anecdotal. That's just my personal experience. And I may be dead wrong, but another reason why I say that is, for example, my father's in fertilizer seed sales. He does own farm travel with producers. And that data is really available to the producer. In fact, you can look it up on their app, and then there it is. You know, and they like that type of data. And as part of the services providing, he's given agronomic services, he's given yield mapping, you know, fertilizer recommendations, seed recommendations. And that's something Extension just doesn't really do. They don't have the, the yield mapping data. They don't have access to those softwares to do that type of thing. It's very expensive to do those things. I mean, for example, to, to find a drone over a field, be able to give somebody NDVI images, I mean, a minimum of $2,000 for the drone. I was told access to some of that John Deere, my acre, is about 7000 a year. I mean, the farmer has it, but if he has it, what, what's he going to do? Go give it to the agent and the agent can give recommendations if the agent's never used it? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I feel like a lot of that, a lot of that information is in the hands of the industry. Now, I may be wrong. I mean, I, I may, be, may be very wrong on that. That's just, like I said, that my experience. Round three simply was trying to figure out what, and trying to reach consensus with multiple rounds. I finally decided that after three rounds and we dropped off the set 12 uh, participants that it was time to you know, finalize this and move on, and that's what we did. So we saw that in the end, in round three, essentially just, they just confirmed what was mentioned in round two, but we did reach a consensus on livestock being AI technologies. And then the row crop ended up being seed genetics. So where I ended this uh, was to do a survey be sent out in January 2024. After we found the results of Delphi, I created a survey uh, that we sent out statewide. And I don't mind showing you that survey. I'll be very happy to. I don't know if, that would, if that's something you want yeah. me to show, Dr. Delmar. I'll be happy to show you the survey. So the survey does contain some questions from the Delphi, just modified. Uh, but it has been tweaked quite a bit, and it is a culmination of a, a pilot I did for Dr. Belmont's class in his econometrics course. I did that one. I'm going to make this bigger. Can I collapse this? Yes. 
and there. Can y'all say that adequately? Okay. No? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. So the, the, the categories of the doctors, this was from a, uh, a project I did in Dr. Delmont's last plot. It was one that I wanted to pilot to see how it would work where we just listed categories of doctors. I've already showed you that and showed you the results. So nothing new there. The reason why I wanted to gather that data is what I would like to see is if there's a difference between the categories of the doctor, they self-identify within the survey, and based on their responses on what influences them, whether it's economic, cost of technology, compatibility, or period points. I want to see if there's any variance between these groups. That's what I'd like to see. Now that may be that may not be the end result that we end up publishing, but it's going to be a component of it. Now this one comes from a study that my main advisor, Dr. Ricketts, and I actually found at a meeting we had together, and he was trying to figure out what are some supporting statements we can ask the uh, survey participants to validate their self-identification in the category of being a lagger or an innovator, other than just saying, I am an innovator. Well, there was a study done by the University of Glasgow that asked on higher education, they asked producers or asked teachers in higher education their different opinions on risk, essentially, whether they were more uh, conservative in their uh, their their approach to uh, issues, or were they more reserved? And so they had a, this was actually their questions, but modified to fit our survey. And we have one more risk accepting or more uh, an innovator early adopter. And two is usually associated with those that are late majority and laggards. So what you, in their study, they took the results of this to validate what you claimed in an early adopter or, or your category of adopter. <clears throat> so we've gone ahead and added that. We also added the decision to adopt or not adopt. And I got this from Dr. Pruitt. Um, he conducted a study that was asking producers, livestock producers, whether they would adopt or not adopt. And I did this as a, as a kind of a, a safe haven. If I didn't get good results in the category of adopters, at least I had binary results on adopt or not adopt. And these are, yes, Dr. Dave. I'm just on, a, on that particular question. Yes. Your survey, are, are you talking about just like cattle producer? It's going out to cattle with this information, yes. And I have another survey that is exactly this with the technologies that were mentioned by the road crop producers and the bell fund that went out to a different email list of just road crop producers. Right. So that's not going to pig producers. This would only go to those listed by the Tennessee Department of Ag and Cattle Producers. Okay. Uh, unless they have filed, the only way they would have a whole producer in there is if they also raise livestock. And if they were listed in there, you know, if they have multi species, then sure. But no, it did not go to the likes of Mr. Tosh or his, his operation. Okay, the other one is just simply identifying what is the most important factor. Uh, this will be easy for. Um, to do to quantify, which included on a Likert scale. And then this was a list of questions that I created. Um, some of them are positive and some of them are negative statements. And in the literature review, uh, it seemed that it was good to do both. Ask positive and negative statements. And then, of course, we'll inverse the results to make sure that they are uh, the same when we do our statistical analysis. It originally had 40. And I pared it down to 24. Uh, I ran this through. I forgot the statistical uh, analysis that Dr. Ricketts had me run through, but we checked it. There was a power variable that we looked at, and if it ended up having a low value, we pulled the question out. I it, it escaped me what we did, but I remember running that analysis, and I didn't stay to Dr. Delmont to <laughs> and use that. Essentially, what it did is if you um, I forgot. I, I can't even remember what it was. But we ran that, ran that analysis, and the questions that were said to lower the validity of the study, we removed those out, ended up removing enough to get it down to about 25. 20, I think it was ended up being 24 total statistics. Okay. And then we were asked the producers as well to rank their um, importance of where they received their information and the method of delivery. And then I added the demographic information for how many years have you been farming, education levels, 
size of the operation and income. And I'm honestly surprised I didn't require this question because I didn't want producers to feel obligated to answer that. I've had no one not answer that yet. Everyone has answered their level of income. So, so far on the road crop side of things, our average has been one to 5,000 acres. And on the livestock, it's our smaller producers. Which we expect that. We have a lot of small producers in our state, very, very few large cattle operations. Uh, now on the income level, this is uh, this is the uh, this is the cattle one. The income ranges for the farm survey are much higher. They're much higher. Uh, I was supposed to <laughs> review the literature for those ranges, but with my background in lending and working with farmers and farm management program and knowing the income levels, I created ranges myself. You could have used the same ranges from the USDA quick step database has the ranges in there. So when you do a search in there, you have to exactly that's true. And I was asked to do that, but I forgot to do it. And now the survey's out. So it is what it is. At this point, it's yes, it is. At this point, it's I'll show you those income levels. I don't I don't think I think I have them listed up here. Let's see I have a lot of this is the and as you can see, the green means they're more conservative. So we already start to see that most of these have described themselves as being conservative as their approach to problem solving. Uh, How does that match there? Uh, interesting. <laughs> Good question. Uh, so most of the conservative would be late majority or lagger. Yeah, late majority. majority. Let's get up here. I'll get back to this. Uh, most of them defined as a early majority or late majority. Okay. Somewhat in there. Uh, very few describe themselves as innovators. I was kind of surprised that when I did the students, I mean, my, there were several that I didn't buy as innovators. Where, now, this is the last option. I told you wrong. I use the income level of less on this one. Actually, this would be the Sorting through the data and loading means just down here in the survey. Here it is. Very bottom. Oh, and Gary, um, There's the income levels. I did have them. I guess they are the same. I thought I changed them. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah. If the survey's going out and that you're calling them livestock here, are uh, they truly livestock or are they a diversified crop? So I'll I'll say this. Livestock? I'll say this. I did not pull up the row crop data for you. I'm pulling it up now. This data set is from the Tennessee Department of Ag, and it's from the Tennessee Agriculture Enhancement Program. So they have to have 30 head of cattle minimum to be in this database. Now, they could be row crop producers with cattle. They could be a hog producer with cattle farm. They could be a part-time producer. There is no distinguishment in the data set. So... Can you ask me again your question? So the question is that you asked them what their income level is. Is that income because they're a livestock and crop produced diversity? I see crop? what you're saying. Did I ask them specifically? I asked them specifically what the farm income is, but now it could be a commingling of enterprises. Yeah. Uh, so these are the gaps, or these are the, the income groupings that I put together to kind of for row crop, so much larger. Uh, in fact, you're probably already interested in the results of the evidence. What happens now if I mean, many farmers are going to get both surveys? Are you, are you going to? Honestly, it wasn't many. I, I ran a duplicate test to see if they were in both groupings and if they were not. I only had one farmer that I knew personally, and I guess he kind of was on both, and so I removed him from one. I ran, I put them all in Excel and then run a duplicate to see if there were any duplication values, and, and I, I cleared all the duplicates. So there was no repeat, which I was surprised. And I, I think I think the reason for that is very few of our row properties have used ag enhancement because it pays so little. For example, on a on a I believe on a uh, grain auger, it may pay a max contract a max reimbursement of five thousand dollars in the grain in the grain scheme of things. Your row properties are five thousand dollars and drop in the bucket, and it's taxable. So most of our producers aren't even full with it anymore on that side of things. But now on the cattle side, they still will. They'll still do that. They can get the they'll get the breeding bull, they can get the breeding um, peppers, they can get the sweet shoot, things like that. 
Uh, I forgot to show you the bone crop information. So not as good of a bell, actually it's a better bell curve. That's the one I, I was saying I was yeah, proud of. Pretty close. But a very good bell curve with the category of adopters. Now the question of whether they conservative or not, that was asked by Dr. Tom, I believe. And let's see here. This one has strongly agree, disagree. Oh my days, I messed up in my survey. I didn't do a yes or no. Gosh, I'm gonna have to modify that. I messed up on my survey design. So let me show you what I did wrong here. Is instead of them having an option of one and two, I gave them an option of a Likert scale this question. But what I'm going to have to do is figure out what's considered a one and what's considered a two and how it gets to it. I may have to throw that out. That's a problem. You can use like that. I would say so. I would probably. Yeah, I probably could remove the neutrals and just use the strongly agree and strongly disagree with my ones and agree and strongly agree with my twos. I don't think I can make an argument for that. What do you think, Dr. Dillon? Probably do that. Did you consider using one survey and just having them choose a question that sent them down the path instead of doing it as two separate surveys? I did, I did but I found that it was easier for me to figure it out in Walters because I, I self-taught myself how to use Walters. Okay. That was the only reason I did it. If you can know them later on, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Okay. I tried to decipher how to do that and I, I pulled with it enough. Well, I guess there it is. It is one and two. Then I'm, I'll have to go back and see what the question is. I did do that. Okay. Hey. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. <laughs> so this one, our the green would be more conservative, so you have to be more conservative in the decision making process. All right. Well, that's good. That I'm going to better tonight. All right. Let me get down here again. I was going to try to say anything that like shows the size of the producers. So they did say that the the majority of the uh, or the most important influential factor to them so far of 31 row crop producers to answer is an economic benefit, followed very closely by <laughs> also the technology. That's right there. Uh, not as many people in listening here in but in fact, several listening is unimportant. Okay. Compatibility is important to them, but not as ranked as high as the economic benefit. And that's the, the, the supporting statements, the yes or um, that you agree with the statement or not agree with the statement. I'll have to categorize it better than I did. I wanted to get out of the income level inside of the producers. I thought y'all might like to see that. Oh, you may like to see this as well. Let's see, they prefer, looks like they prefer the most important thing to them, right? One the most, fill days in person meetings and work out. Or are you also in agreement with blue as they rank it as number one? So the blue bars that are the longest are going to be word of mouth is number one, chapter two is fill days and on farm visits. Uh, average age of the producer, no surprise there. How long have you been farming? Most of 20 plus years, no surprise there. And then uh, income level, let's see that here. High school, some of the bachelor's degree. Ah, this is what I said earlier, the average size of the producer, they said it was one to 5,000 acres. Over half the group is in that category. I honestly was surprised that I had a two that were 10,000 acres plus, to be honest with you. Because I sorted through the group and I tried to identify the producers that I knew that were of that size. I didn't know anybody on the list that was that size. But now, again, anecdotal. Uh, there were some producers that were here at Western City that their name was absent from the list. So I didn't realize that we had some that were in other parts of the state, maybe, or just people that I wasn't aware of. There's plenty of people. Yeah, some of them. Are some of your producers from along the river? You know, get down there in the Delta. Right? Yes, uh, yes, Lauderdale, uh, Dyer, Tipton County. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And here's one thing I didn't ask that I might have, should have, and I just now thought about it, is I didn't ask if they farm multi state. Yeah, that's one thing that I didn't. But now they identify as a Tennessee farmer, is how they identify because they're asked in the opening, are they a Tennessee producer or not? Before they get but anyway, most of the producers were in this hundred and five hundred thousand dollar annual farm income, which after expenses and they pay the taxes, it doesn't surprise me there a bit. Okay. Uh, was there anything else, Dr. Dunham, you wanted me to address? Okay. Because I knew at first you said if we had students here, there were some things you wanted me to go, like, talk about going through the process, but you all had your PhD, so there's no sense for me to talk. We <laughs> discussed about maybe talking about some of the issues you've had with the survey, really the, and, so, 
what about numbers? Do you think that sufficient numbers? For well, so I sent it out to 6,000 producers or 6,000 email addresses. I'll put it that way. I have received over 250 responses. So I'm not to the 10% level yet. <clears throat> I've sent it out last Friday. I sent a reminder email just before walking in here today. And I'm going to do that. I've been advised to do that for a month. Send four reminders. I'm not going to do phone calls, although we do have phone numbers for the producers. Uh, I'm hoping I can get four or 500. Uh, I don't know that if that will be, may have to do some bootstrapping, may have to do something else to you know account for that, may have to do a dummy variable, if I've messed up on some of these surveys when we combine the row crop and the livestock producers. But, I honestly would like to analyze the row crop producers and livestock producers separately and then maybe combine them because the surveys are the exact same with the exception of the decision to adopt or not adopt the technology. So I'll probably analyze them separately and together anyway and see what results I get. Uh, I did have someone that is an, in, he's in academia reply to my email and tell me how poorly designed my survey was and how I would buy statistical significant information, but at the end of the day, what I found would be perfect. <laughs> and to be honest with you, and to be honest with you, I got a response out of it, so I really don't care. So <laughs> that's all I think at the end of the day is responses. Are you happy with uh, the results in general? Are, are you uh, surprised with thought um, worked out the way you thought it would? I think it's working out the way I thought it would for two reasons. I've done two pilots of this already, and I, I feel like we have ironed out <clears throat> some of the kinks. Um, I'm honestly surprised at the response rate. I thought it would be way worse than it has been. I was fearful that nobody would reply to it. You know, get very, very few. Honestly, I was hoping for 200. I'm already over that. Um, the results itself has not surprised me yet. The only thing that has surprised me is I was I was actually kind of shocked to a degree by the larger producers actually throwing this out. I figured they would trash it. I figured they would have got that email and just throw it away. But you know the weather was in my favor. Everybody's out of the field. It's downtime for them. That's really want to send it out now. It's downtime for them. The only thing that I, I guess my, my biggest issue with this whole thing is I have had a, a very challenging time of getting feedback from the dissertation committee. And so a lot of this, I wouldn't say I've done it in a vacuum, but it's, it's I like feedback because I, I have a lot of uncertainty of what I'm doing because this is my first time doing it. And, and it's not like when I did my master's with you. You know, I, I mean, you already had a good relationship and you were very open to communication and you got a lot of help. That's not been my experience this time around. And um, it's it's not been as, as a pleasant of an experience. And I just feel like sometimes I'm going into a blind. So I'm not really sure. Like, for example, I don't know if this is good or not. <laughs> you know, I think it's, I don't even know if it's publishable. You know, I, I don't know. I don't have any feedback from my committee yet on this. So we'll see, I guess. So your committee didn't approve your survey before you sent it to me. You may be honest with you. I sent it to my major advisor and I got a response quick enough that I know he didn't even read it. He said, looks good, send it out. So hope so. And I asked I asked supporting, I asked additional questions to clarify some things. I got the same response. So he sent it out. So. You didn't send up, you didn't do some pilots. For I did it with my students. I did it with my students as a pilot, which was a recommendation of my advisor, advisor and it worked. That was a good, that was a good suggestion. Um, <laughs> but it's it's been interesting, that's for sure. I didn't, I mean, I can't say that I haven't enjoyed it. I've enjoyed learning how to do this. I mean, prior to this, I didn't have any clue how to do this type of surveys because any surveys or research I did extension we did on on farm interviews is what we did. We would go to the producer, ask the questions and then come back and formalize it. Didn't do anything, you know, theme analysis or nothing. Everything was quantitative. But we were there asking them and you know handwriting notes and then we would just kind of write those notes up in something that we thought was good feedback and we would publish it as an extension article, which is you know nothing compared to something here would be very low stakes. You know, not hard to get that at all. But Delphi said when I heard that, started describing it, 
Have you ever heard of an analytical hierarchy process? Uh-huh. You're in that term? But very similar, I think you talk to a panel of experts and you get these rankings from them. You get what you develop weights out of there. I think you kind of in a different direction. It's kind of maybe you talk to a panel of experts, but what's you work with? Well, I think I think so. I mean, the structure I think is good. I mean, I have literature, peer reviewed literature to back up what we've done. Uh, the feedback that I did get from uh, Dr. Ricketts and when I built the survey, because what we did, I will give Dr. Ricketts credit, is we did sit down on a Zoom meeting for about an hour one day, and we went over the pilot, and we he recommended some changes. We found some articles to try to pattern our adapter to a degree. They were in other fields, but we made them agricultural related, and it seems to it seems to work. Uh, when I sent it out to the students, I asked them to give me feedback on how long it took you to do it, and was it very um, user friendly? And everybody said it was very user friendly. The average time on the pilot was eight minutes to complete the survey, which I was my goal was under ten. And so I haven't looked at the response rate on the on the real exam, or sorry, the real survey, and I haven't looked at that. But um, I don't know. It's it's been good. I, I think it's good. I don't know. Y'all make so many different. I'm kind of getting to the point now where I really don't know where we're headed. You know, I would like to see that this is something that I can actually put into a dissertation. I don't think it may not be published or it may satisfy a dissertation for us. It may not be able to be an article. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. It's in my world, right? And you have some ways to justify how you chose your questions. Yes. Worst case scenario, you end up with your PhD and nothing publishable yet. I'm fine with that. I mean, I'm good with that. At the end of the day, it's a box check. That's probably sounds terrible. The one thing I have learned in all this, I don't know, it's how much research is done. If all I know is that when you go to these data databases and they tell you how many times the article did review and then cite it, when you read how much articles are written but it's not used, that's very disheartening. <laughs> Because you realize how some of this research isn't used at all. So uh, that may be mine. <laughs> it may be never cited again. But we're only evaluated on how, how much we publish. We're right. evaluated on how many you're reading. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I guess I could assign that as an assignment to my students and really get that number up there. Well, how, how do you feel being an employed agency mark and having to do with people? I'm fine with that. I agreed to it when I hired on. It was never, I will say, Dr. Totten never required it of me. He just asked for it. And so I agreed to do it. But I'll tell you, like I've told all my students, when I get my PhD, I'm going to go to Rule King, and I'm going to buy a postal digger, and I'm going to hang it on my office wall, and I'm going to put my doctorate in the floor, and I'm going to tell students, that PhD is more useful than the one on the floor. So I've actually used that PhD. I heard that we had a we had a uh, speaker come over here for the ag finance conference years ago, and uh, they had a panel up there. And it was we had some of our staff and uh, some others that were here, and one of them didn't have a PhD. And he, that's what he said. He said, "Well, I've got a PhD. It's in my shed at home. It's my post hole digger." <laughs> I just thought that was funny. I always thought that was comical, so I thought I might do that myself. But I don't know. I mean, it's so far. I mean, it's it's not been a tough program. I really thought. I really thought I would learn a lot more out of it. You know, because I felt like I learned a lot in my master's program. Um, I don't feel that I've learned as much with a handful of classes. And I'll say, I've said it from Del in the room, I'll say it from the room. I learned a lot from Dr. Del Monte's comments class. I learned a lot from Dr. Burrell's research methods. And um, it was a statistics course. I learned a lot from those two. The program at TSU is a combination of ag science courses along with EDD courses. I didn't learn a lot of ADD courses. They were like leadership and management, educational law. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like they were very hard sciences, obviously not in social sciences. Not in social sciences, I kept that wrong. But anyway, I didn't really learn a lot from those courses. And then a lot of them have been, uh, like one of them is a special topics class with literally with nothing but guest speakers. You know, you write an article, you know, a little bit of a summary of those. I mean, I didn't learn anything out of that personally. Um, there's been other few courses that, like the, the instructor was gone for half of the semester and we literally read a book and wrote reports on. 
you know, I, I didn't get much out of that either. I don't know. I had really high expectations going into it. Maybe I had too high expectations, but I had learned as much as I thought it Because I've heard a lot of y'all talk about y'all's PhD programs and, and Dr. Melbourne and others, and, you know, they learned a lot, you know, and I just don't feel like that. But it's an online program. Online, isn't it new? It's new. I'm the first one through it. So. It's a little different field from the ones that we did. I, I think uh, ours were so math intensive. Um, well, that is. Help to learn things. And, you know. yeah, yeah, you're yeah, it takes those qualifying. When you did it, your PhD were before you got the job, right? Or, uh, you weren't doing it like online or anything, right? Your PhD was you were on campus. Oh, yeah. 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 I guess the one class, no, I did forget one class. We did have one class that was, um, we had to write a paper essentially. They gave us recommendations of new teaching practices to use in your class. It was one of the ADD classes. It was an instructional technology course, if I'm not mistaken. Now, I did learn a lot out of that course, and I've applied some of that. Like, I've used more flipped classroom in my teaching. Like, today, we had an exercise in my uh, Ag Finance course. I had everybody in here, and I broke them into groups of two. And actually, I broke them into groups of six, two groups, sorry. And I had a, one group assume that they were in uh, the midst of the financial crisis of the 1980s, and how did they survive it? And then one that was past it, and what did you learn to then put up as, like, a preventative measures? And so, you know, those are things that we did, you know, like role play breakout sessions before that. I never did that. Straight lecture, mostly exams and quizzes in my classes. So I think it's made me a better teacher, which if nothing else, I guess that's something. But now, I don't know about the research. I think that's not my forte. <laughs> that's not my forte. Not a traditional presentation for you, Dr. Oh, this, was, this was actually. It's interesting to see what you're doing. It's an easy way for us to find it. Yeah. Now you know. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. I like the little, you know, the zip yeah. thing. Yeah. We're gonna good. We've got uh, we've got two people going. Uh, two you want me to end uh, Two student groups. Uh, yeah, we've got two students groups going next.